types. Okay, so we're going to start differential equations today. Chapter on differential equations. And um, the, the, the key thing about differential equations is that any way you can solve them is fine. If you can find a solution, you differentiate it. If, it's, uh, if it satisfies the equation, uh, you're golden. You don't, um, you don't need to follow a specific routine or procedure. Um, so let me go on now with some definitions that um, uh, I'm running out of a good chalk and so I'm going to have a little trouble. Whoa, what was that? No, it's a piece of chalk. Um, so it's convenient to talk about uh, operators, that is to say combinations of derivatives. So a sum m equals zero to n h sub m of x, the nth derivative. So this is a an nth order linear ordinary differential operator. It's ordinary because there are no partial derivatives. It's linear because derivatives are linear. Linear operators. It's nth order because the highest derivative is dn dx to the n. Now, um, the linearity here is that L of, say, A, F plus B, G, I was writing G, and it came out wrong. Uh, A and B are constants, then this is A, L, F plus B, L, G. So that's what linearity means. Well, that's because derivatives are linear. One can um, make one, one can one has that the, the the differential operator on a f plus b g is a l f plus b l g. A famous example is l equal to minus d two the x squared minus k squared. So this is the harmonic case, which you've undoubtedly seen. Um, it's sometime, it, it's nice to be able to write um, second order different linear different ordinary differential operators in this form. P of x, d by dx, plus q of x. This is what's called self-adjoint. Self-adjoint form. And you don't need to worry about that at the moment, but um, I just, just mentioned it to you. We'll be talking about self-adjoint differential operators later, but that'll be a couple of weeks from now. We go to the new building next week. And um, I sent you an email, I think, saying where in the new building we'd be. I've forgotten what the room is. Yes. Yes. I was returning your call. So the solutions of this equation, of course, are 
let's see, I just skipped something. Um, if you have an equation of this form, L f of x equals zero, this is said to be homogeneous. So, and it's homogeneous because every every term in the equation is proportional to f or one of its derivatives. If on the other hand you have an equation in the form L f of x equals s of x, where s doesn't have anything to do with f, s is a source term. Uh, then this is said to be inhomogeneous. So if you have an equation that's linear and homogeneous, then you can add solutions. Um, so for example, if L F1 is 0 and L F2 is 0, then L of AF1 plus BF2, because the operator is linear, this is ALF1 plus BLF2. And because it's homogeneous, each of these is equal to zero. So this is A times zero plus B times zero, which is just zero. So, um, the linearity is what gets you the additivity, um, but in this case, you also need uh, the homogeneity. Um, and an example of this, of course, is the this equation over here, which we can rewrite as d two d x squared plus k squared f of x is equal to zero. Here the solutions are sine kx and cosine kx. And you can then add them. So you can say a, cos a sine kx plus b cosine kx. And that will be a solution. Now, if we have functions y1, y2, up to yn of x, and The only numbers k1, k2, up to kn that satisfy this equation, that is to say, such that the sum is equal to 0, are k1 equals k2 equals dot 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 equals kn equals 0. Then we say that the y's, the y's, are linearly independent. So linear independence means that no linear combination of them vanishes. You, you have to have all the k's. Otherwise, they're linearly dependent. Now, if you suppose we have an nth order linear ordinary homogeneous equation like this, and we have n solutions k equals 1, 2, up to n. 
And suppose that these are linearly independent and complete in the space of solutions, so that every solution of this equation can be written as some sum aj at j of x. So we suppose that this is the case. Then um, then suppose we, we, in, we, we now look at a different, let's look at the inhomogeneous version of this, which would be L of f equals some source term, s of x. So now, um, let's imagine that fi1 and fi2 are two solutions of this equation. Well then, L of fi1 of x minus fi2 of x will be zero because this will give us s of x, this will also give us s of x, so you subtract to get zero. But um, this has an amusing consequence, a con uh, uh, consequence. Anyway, we can conclude that f of i1, well, first of all, that f of i1 minus f of i2, that this is the solution of the homogeneous equation, and we already know the general solution of the homogeneous equation. So that's a sum aj of j of x. So then, we have a solution, the first solution of the inhomogeneous equation can be written as a second solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. So this is, this is a general property of linear equations, namely that the general solution of the inhomogeneous equation is a solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. Let me say that again in case I screwed up the first time. The general solution of the inhomogeneous equation is any solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. Now, I've been emphasizing how um, nice linear equations are. Physics isn't really linear. We use linear differential equations um, a lot because we can solve them. Um, Nonlinear differential equations are much harder to solve. And uh, an example might be minus f double prime is f cubed, or f prime squared is f, or f prime is e to the minus f. So nonlinear equations are much harder to, to solve. On the other hand, we now have computers. And computers can um, numerically integrate for us, and we can um, we can solve essentially anything um, numerically. Um, so let's let's now think about linear partial differential equations. So such an equation might look like this. The sum of our functions m1, m2, mk of x times a partial m1 plus m2 plus mk 
partial x1 to the m1, x2 to the m2, m xk to the mk, and so it's for some summing over the m's, or the m and m's if you want. Um, and this is f of x zero. So this is the homogeneous case. So this is a linear partial differential equation of order n, where n is m1 plus m2 plus, plus m k. Um, because a partial differential equation is a whole differential equation of the partial derivatives. Um, so you can take, since the thing is linear, you can take linear combinations with constant coefficients and you still have a solution. So um, you would have L of again AF1 plus BF2 is AL F1 plus B. This is if A and B are constants, whereas if they depend upon X, then of course this derivative would get in the way. Um, let me just mention parenthetically that as we learned when we were studying Fourier series and Fourier transforms, that when the G's are actually constants rather than functions of X, we can solve these equations typically almost instantaneously by writing Green's functions in terms of delta functions. Um, now, just as before, if we go, if we now consider the inhomogeneous case, L f of x equals s of x, where now this is a linear, a linear. Um, partial differential equation, if you have um, two solutions of the inhomogeneous equation, F1, say LF1 is F, LS2, F2 is S, then L of F1 minus F2 is zero, so this is a solution of the homogeneous equation. And if we then have a space of solutions of the homogeneous equation, we can then say that f1 of x minus f2 of x must be some sum of some coefficients, aj, fj of x, when these are all solutions of the homogeneous equation. And then we can say that that the first solution of the inhomogeneous equation is the second solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. So we are back at what we learned for the ordinary differential equation case, namely that the general solution of the inhomogeneous equation is any particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. Okay. How about questions? Remember, I now have candy and I'm going to Costco yesterday. All right. Um, what we're now going to talk about for a little while is separable uh, differential equations. And a separable, di separable differential equation is one such that we can write the solution f of x1, x2, xk, say, as, let us say, x1 of x1, x2 of x, I don't know why I used x twice, xk, of xk, in which each of the x's satisfies some ordinary differential equation. And an example of this is the Laplace, is 
the Laplacian um, The Laplacian is um, invariant under rotations, and so it has a simple structure that that allows one to, in many coordinate systems, to write it as um, to decompose it into into three ordinary uh, differential equations. So I'm going to now go through some examples, and because these examples are, um, well, there's so many details, I, I don't think that doing it on, um, doing it on the board is efficient. Let's see if I can get this thing to wake up. Hello? This thing has gone completely, oh my goodness! We connected it to power, but we didn't turn on the power. Well, I don't know quite what ha what the explanation is here, but um, the computer is charging, so I think I'll just cope with that by going to the board the first couple of examples and then when the, when the computer wakes up, I can um, switch to, uh, and go back to the computer. All right, so let me give some examples of this. Um, as I said, the, one example is L of pi, say, is and in rectangular coordinates, this is then partial to partial x squared plus partial to partial y squared plus partial to partial z squared on uh, phi of x, y, z equals zero. So this can, this equation separates in rectangular, polar, spherical, and in fact in 11 different uh, coordinate systems. Probably more than that, but um, Moss and Feshbach identified 11 uh, such coordinate systems. Uh, this is an equation that you know from electrodynamics because it is just Poisson's equation, um, namely minus Laplacian of phi is the charge density divided by the electric constant. Um, another example of um, separable equations um, are Maxwell's equations in empty space. Del, del dot E is zero, del dot B e is zero, curl of E is minus B dot, and curl of B times C squared is E dot. I'm using, um, at least my intention was to use SI units throughout the book, uh, except when I revert to natural units to avoid lots and lots of H bars and Cs. Um, so you can show, in fact, that these equations imply, by the way, there's a notation that I didn't explain. Some, uh, this is the Laplacian, it's a shorter way of writing this because you don't have to, well obviously this is more compact than that. Anyway, well, um, Maxwell's equations in empty space tell you that the electric and magnetic fields obey uh, the wave equation, Laplacian of B 
double dot over c squared, and so this uh, makes, uh, well, it's all sorts of things possible from the point of view of um, commerce or radio, television, the internet, they all rely on these equations. Um, and they're separable in rectangular cylindrical spherical coordinates, and we can find simple solutions for them, namely E of uh, K and omega is uh, some vector epsilon. These are particular solutions of these homogeneous equations. E to the i, k dot r minus omega t, and t of k and omega. Uh, this would be k hat cross epsilon over c um, e to the i, k dot r minus omega t. So this is the same epsilon, this is a polarization vector. The magnetic field then is perpendicular to the electric field um, for these solutions. Now, has the computer awakened? Let me see. My good, yeah, no. Apparently it's still Oh wait, it is waking up. Well, it may be still a little bit asleep. So it's very groggy. Um, so let's look at Helmholtz's equation in two dimensions. Helmholtz's equation in two dimensions are Minus Laplacian of f of x and y is, which of course is minus partial 2 partial x squared plus partial 2 partial y squared of f is k squared f. And this is separable, and this is probably the simplest example of separability. What we do is we say, well, let's see, maybe the space when we write it here. We let f of x and y equal x of x times y of y, and then we just substitute that in there. And what we find is minus partial 2 partial x squared plus partial 2 partial y squared x y. Well, this is minus y times, let me just write it as, since x is just a function of x, it's just the second derivative of x, minus x, second derivative of y, is equal to k squared x y. And now we divide both sides by x y, and we get, uh, the equation minus x double prime over x minus y double prime over y is equal to um, simply k squared. And now we've got the first term is a function of x, second term is a function of y, and k is not a function of anything, so it's just a constant. And so what we can say then is that um, this has to be a constant. This has to be a constant. That has to be constant. Of course, that is a, con a constant. And so we say minus x double prime over x is equal to say a squared minus y double prime over y is equal to b squared. And then we want a squared plus b squared to equal k squared. So that's basically how we solve this. 
And the solutions to this are very simple, namely x can be uh, e to the i a x, y can be e to the i b y, and then uh, any linear combination. So uh, have a sum over a and b of, um, let us say, alpha e to the i a x plus beta e to the i b y is a solution. This will be a solution with arbitrary constants alpha and beta as long as a squared plus b squared is equal to k squared. So that's, that's sort of the, the, that's the basic idea of um, uh, separability and um, all of, uh, essentially all the examples of separability are like this. And this is the, this is the simplest case, I think, that I can think. All right, now the computer is awakened. Um, so let me go through some of these examples um, on the computer. Otherwise, uh, it will sort of take forever. Um, OK, we are in the wrong place that we want to be in chapter. And we want to be there. And, uh, so. Okay, so we've just seen that um, we've seen that example, but now we can also look at Helmholtz's equation in um, polar coordinates, rho phi. And the two-dimensional Laplacian in uh, polar coordinates is, sim is simply this, which we can rewrite as that if we want. And now if we let f be capital rho, capital phi, and substitute into the Helmholtz equation, which is this equation, but in polar coordinates, what we get is this expression here. After we multiply both sides by rho squared and divide by capital rho, capital phi. So then what we have is um, that n squared is a constant. Phi double prime over phi would have to be a constant. And then this, these three terms are functions of rho. And, um, so these three terms have to be a constant also because they're equal to something that is either a function of phi or a constant. In fact, it has to be a constant, n squared. So if we take this equation equals n squared, we get this expression here. And it turns out that this is Bessel's equation. Um, so, Feel free to ask questions. Remember, I have a ton of equations, a ton of candies here. In fact, there are 90. There were 90 in the box, and I've only given out four or so, or five, and so you can ask 85 questions, and I'll load it. Um, anyway, this is Bessel's equation. Now, if we rescale Bessel's equations, normal, normally is uh, written in this form x squared jn double prime plus x jn prime plus x squared jn equals n squared jn. Um, and so since, since that's what jn of x does, if we consider jn of k rho e to the i n phi, then this is a solution to Helmholtz's equation. Um, by the way, if we want the function F, the solution F to be single-valued, uh, 
as we go around phi, 0 to 2 pi, then n has to be an integer. On the other hand, if the physical region is less than that, then n, n does not have to be an integer. We go to Helmholtz's equation in three dimensions. Well, obviously, it looks like this. And in rectangular coordinates, we just take minus Laplacian of x, y, z, and we get these three terms equal to that. We divide by x, y, z, and then we see that we have that x has to be a function of x, y, a function of y, z, a function of z. And um, if x double prime, minus x double prime is ax, and so forth for y and z, uh, then a squared plus b squared plus c squared has to equal k squared. And so possible solutions are just these exponentials. And you can just take any, you, you take, uh, any product x a y b z c will be a solution of Helmholtz's equation in three dimensions as long as a squared plus b squared plus c squared is equal to k squared. Because the thing is linear, you can add them all together, and then you have a complete set of uh, solutions. Um, Helmholtz's equation is also separable in polar coordinates. And um, as I said, this is, is basically because the Laplacian is, has rotational symmetry, and in fact, it's separable in 11 different coordinate systems at least. So we said f equal to rho phi zeta, I guess, and um, multiply both sides by minus rho squared over rho phi zeta, and then we get this equation. Now, um, what we can do is we can set z equal to e to the alpha z. And this equation then just becomes the earlier equation, uh, 7.24. It becomes this equation for a particular, with k squared replaced by uh, alpha squared plus k squared. And so the solution then is a Bessel function. By the way, these are cylindrical Bessel functions. They're also spherical Bessel functions. The spherical ones, because spherical symmetry is so much more symmetric, the spherical Bessel functions are much nicer functions, whereas the ordinary Bessel functions are really quite mind-boggling functions. I mean, you can write them as an infinite series. Anyway, the solution then is, is the cylindrical Bessel function of argument square root of k squared plus alpha squared times rho, e the i n phi, e the alpha z, and n is an integer if the full range of phi is physical. Um, if we take the case k equal to zero, then Helmholtz's equation reduces to Laplace's equation and then um, the solution is simple. It's Jn and k rho e to the i n phi e to the alpha z. Um, here we said z equal to a real exponential e to the alpha z. If instead we set it equal to um, an imaginary exponential, then the z equation is z double prime is minus alpha squared z. And then instead of alpha squared here, we have minus alpha squared. And that's the solution. If, on the other hand, alpha squared is bigger than k squared, then the argument of the cylindrical Bessel function becomes imaginary. And we're dealing with the modified Bessel function. So the modified Bessel function is the cylindrical Bessel function at imaginary argument. Um, Helmholtz equation is also separable in spherical coordinates. I don't know why I capitalized the S. Um, and in spherical coordinates, the Laplacian looks like this. Um, by the way, the first term you can rewrite as R inverse times the second derivative of Rf. That's sometimes more convenient. Um, we just said f equal to R of theta phi. Uh, we let phi equal to the i m phi, 
multiply both sides by r squared over r phi r theta phi, we get this uh, expression here. So this is a function of r, this is a function of theta, this is a function of theta, this is a function of r. This is actually the first and the fourth terms of function of r. And the middle terms are functions of theta. And so we set the r dependent terms equal to L plus 1 minus k squared. And we set the theta dependent terms to minus L plus 1. And uh, that the equation for the theta dependent terms then is the equation for the associated Legendre function. We'll study these things in chapter 9. And the equation that it satisfies is, is this equation, which no doubt seen in electrodynamics classes. Um, the, the phi equation is e to the i m phi, and it, it's single valued, then m has to be an integer. Single valued on the whole 0 to 2 pi, then m must be an integer. Turns out that L also must be an integer if um, theta, if the associated Legendre function is to be single valued and finite for the whole range of theta from 0 to pi. Um, the function f equal to r phi r theta phi then obeys, um, will obey Helmholtz's equation as long as we choose r to be a spherical Bessel function. And as I said, these are the nice Bessel functions. The spherical Bessel functions obey this equation and um, they're, they're actually quite, they're almost like trigonometric. Now, in special relativity, one can get quite confused by this the first time you see it. Um, so let me try to explain it clearly. Um, the time and space coordinates are often written as x0 equal to ct and x equal to x with the upper indices. Now, this Spatial indices, whether the in, spatial indices are up or down doesn't matter. But the time index, uh, it matters whether it's up or down. So if you lower the zero on x zero, that's equivalently to that's equivalent to multiplying by minus one. The invariant product is, and of course these things are written as four vectors, f x up is zero, x is c t comma vector x. And the invariant in the product, px, is the dot product of the spatial term, terms minus the product of the two zeroth components. And those zeroth components are um, et. And um, we can write this as p lower a, x upper a, with the understanding that p lower zero is minus p upper zero. And so this p lower zero is minus p upper zero. So that's the trick. And um, I remember when I was a graduate student, when I first saw this, uh, the professor was racing through the material didn't bother to explain this, or if he did, I didn't catch it anyway. So I was constantly going back and forth because um, I knew that if I lowered or raised an index, it would introduce a minus sign, but I didn't know which one was the plus sign. So which one was the ordinary time derivative. Um, and in fact, let's, let's get to that. Um, so as I said, p lower zero is minus p upper zero. p upper zero is is um, uh, is the quantity that's the physical quantity. X lower zero is minus x is minus c t. Now the derivatives are normally written. The derivatives with a lower index 
are the normal ones. That's because the definition of, of, of partial sub A of F is the true partial derivative of F with respect to X upper A. So these are the normal derivatives, the ordinary time and space derivatives. On the other hand, if you raise this index A, then what, what you're doing is, actually this is, this is wrong. This is only true for the time component that there's a minus sign here. So for the time component, the, the partial with an upper zero, maybe I should write this on the board since this is a, apparently a typo in the book. In other words, partial zero of f is partial f partial x zero, and so that's partial f c partial t. So this is f dot over c. It's only the zeroth component that changes when you raise or lower indices. So d zero f is minus partial f partial x zero, or it's plus partial f partial x lower zero. But x lower zero is minus x upper zero. And so this is minus f dot over c. On the other hand, the gradient, the spatial, the spatial components don't are insensitive to this upper and lower indices. You can raise and lower as you want for the spatial directions. What I'm describing here is the nor is the metric that people use most commonly in general relativity and some people in particle physics. Many people in particle physics and a few people in general relativity use the opposite sign convention. So you have to, if you're reading a book, you sort of have to, or an article, you have to be alert that um, sometimes the metric is Minus, um, well, it's c squared, t squared, isn't it? So sometimes this is the metric. This is the metric I use. But on the other hand, some books will use the metric c squared, t squared, minus x dot x. This is a metric of three minus signs. This is a metric of one minus sign. This is obviously the better metric, but I don't know, some people want minus signs or the, the reason, well, never mind the reason, anyway. So, um, that's what these, uh, that's how these derivatives go, and I think maybe I should go through these examples quickly because they're just examples, but it's just good for you to see this. Um, the, if we use natural units where h bar and c are one, then um, in flat space, Minkowski space is just a fancy word, a way of saying flat space, um, special relativity. The analog of the Laplacian is uh, Laplacian minus the second derivative with respect to ct. And Oh, wow. I, oh, I have c equal to 1, so I'm, this is not wrong. So, and in as much as a triangle can be the divergence of the gradient, for this case, one uses a box to represent all four derivatives. This is the four, the sort of a four-dimensional Laplacian. So three-dimensional is a triangle, four-dimensional can be a square. It, it saves writing, and so people, some people use box. Um, 
So once again, this is the um, the Klein-Gordon equation is box minus m squared on A is, which is of course Laplacian minus second root effect at time minus m squared of A. This describes a scalar field of mass m. And um, um, so if we set A of X equal to B, P of X, where P of X, of course, is P dot X minus P zero X zero, then the kth partial derivative is just P sub K uh, times a B prime of P X. And um, the Klein-Gordon equation then becomes P vector squared minus P zero squared times P double prime minus M squared P, or P squared, the second derivative of a function P B minus M squared B is zero. So the function B, B of P dot X is just E to the I P dot X. And um, you then have to have P has to satisfy P squared plus M squared equals zero. And this is the condition that the energy be the square root of P squared plus M squared. So it describes a particle of momentum P and mass M and energy P zero. And the field of a spinless boson in the quantum uh, field describing a spinless boson is then an integral with this uh, dqp over the square root. This is something that we learned when we did Fourier transforms. And the quantum part of the thing is an annihilation operator times the solution e to the i p x, which is up here somewhere. Because we lost it. Anyway, plus the creation operator e to the minus i p x. And the the annihilation creation operator satisfy this commutation relation. Um, the annihilation operators commute with themselves, the creation operators commute with themselves, but the annihilation operator and the creation operator have a delta function commutation relation. And these relations mean that the field and its time derivative have a commutator which is I times the three-dimensional direct delta function. Notice that that's a generalization of the ordinary quantum mechanical relation. XP is I H bar. Um, um, and maybe I should turn the lights on just to uh, say something about that. In other words, if you have a quantum, a quantum mechanical system with many uh, coordinates and various conjugate momenta, then the commutation relation is I H bar Kronecker delta L K. So it's zero unless L equals K. If L equals K, it's I H bar. In quantum field theory, the analog of X turns into a field phi at x, and of course this is at a particular time, and this is also a particular time. The analog of p is the momentum, or it's in, in this particular case it's just phi dot, and, and instead of k we have y, and this is an equal time commutation relation in quantum mechanics it's also an equal time commutation relation in quantum field theory, and it will be I H bar delta Q by X minus one. Um, so now the electromagnetic field, and those of you going into optics might want to pay attention to this, um, if we 
Electrodynamics is an example of what's called the gauge theory. Um, gauge theories have a lot more symmetry than the way we do this. And um, what has been found in the last, I don't know, 40 years or so, or 50, 60 years, 70 years, is that um, gauge theories are more and more important in, in fundamental physics. And in fact, the string theory people are saying that the only theories that are consistent with, with string theory are um, gauge theories. And um, but the standard model already is a gauge theory. And um, general relativity can be thought of as a gauge theory. So everything is a gauge theory. Anyway, the electromagnetic electrodynamics was the first gauge theory. And um, when you quantize it, you need to pick a particular gauge. And the most physical gauge is the Coulomb gauge, which is at the divergence of the three components of the, of the space part of the uh, electromagnetic potential or field is zero. That means then that the time component is a function of the charge density. And it also means that the uh, space components of the of a satisfied box A equals zero, which notice that's the Klein-Gordon equation, but from massless, the massless Klein-Gordon equation. And the absence of mass here is because, of course, the photon is massless. And once we've gotten, we start out with four components to A, but we get rid of A0 because it's proportional to, it's related to the charge density. We get rid of an, one of the spatial components by imposing Coulomb, well, the Coulomb gauge or the radiation gauge condition. That leaves two components of A as physical, and so there are two polarizations. So we sum all the two polarization vectors we have annihilation operator, annihilation operator for, for polarization S, momentum P, the solution to the massless Klein-Gordon equation, and the usual factor here. And this gives you the electromagnetic field in quantum electrodynamics, quantum optics, whatever. Um, the energy is the modulus of the momentum because the photon is massless. By the way, because the photon is massless, the wave properties of light are more evident than the particle aspects of light. Um, although I guess if you get up to gamma radiation, then it's no longer true than the particle. Anyway, the dot product of the polarization vector with the momentum vanishes. This is the uh, commutation relation. And um, although the commutation relation for the annihilation creation operators for photons is simple, the, in the Coulomb gauge, the commutation relation between the field and its time derivative is more complicated. It's a transverse delta function because of the Coulomb gauge condition. Another partial differential equation, linear first order partial differential equation, is the Dirac equation. It is, um, wow, what's the what happened? Very strange. The computer did not go out, but it went away. And we're still getting electricity to the computer, but I don't know. The, the, I guess this is one reason why we do need a new building. And we'll be holding classes in the new building as of Tuesday. Um, since the computer has failed me again, um, I'll have to turn the lights on and try to do... Okay, 
example here. The the Dirac equation is um, uh, defined in terms of four matrices that are called gamma matrices. These are matrices. So A goes from 1 to 4, or actually it goes from 0 to 3 is the way we normally do it. And we say that the anti-commutator of two gamma matrices, which is gamma A gamma B plus gamma B gamma A, is equal to 2 A to AB, and A to AB is 2 it's uh, minus one, 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 one. Zeros everywhere else. So, so in other words, the anti-commutator of gamma zero with gamma zero is two a to zero zero. That's minus two. On the other hand, the with the spatial components, the anti-commutator, if it's the same component, it's just two. And um, the Dirac equation then is gamma B, gamma A dA plus M delta B C chi C of X equals zero. So we'll call Fermion of mass M, that's the uh, equation. And it turns out that if you have any solution of the, any field, the scalar field, so we did scalar fields um, earlier today, you have a scalar field that satisfies the klein gordon equation for mass m, then uh, a solution of the, of the Dirac equation is gamma b db minus m on phi. That will solve the Dirac equation. And um, the simplest Actually, I think this has come back on. So let's see. Do we actually? No. Spoke too soon. Um, so the the simplest Dirac equation. Uh, maybe I'll go to this board over here. We have the board here. Um, the simplest fermion. Um, Field is the Majorana field, and that's an integral dqp over 2 pi to the 3 halves, a sum over two spin states ub of p and s, a of p and s, e to the i px plus bb of p and s, a dagger of p and s, is minus i p dot x. And this, this is a field that describes a neutral fermion. The more general case is a charged fermion. So if you have two Majorana fields, or two Majorana particles of the same mass represented by two Majorana fields, you can make one Dirac field as 1 over square root of 2 chi 1 of x plus i chi 2 of x. So a Dirac field is a linear combination of two Majorana fields of the same mass, and in this case you have um, you have a field that can represent charged particles of mass m and uh, the, the 
the particles will have, say, charge Q, the antiparticles will have charge minus Q. And they will have the same mass automatically. And we are still dead here when it comes to the computer. The computer looks fine. I, I don't know. What's, do, you, do you understand? Oh, maybe the thing timed out? Here, I turned it off. Let's see if I can turn it back on again. It's not responding at all to my... It takes a minute to turn back on. What's that? It does switch it on. Excuse me? It's switching on. Oh, you think it is? Yeah. Yeah. Exxon is a lousy company in my book. Apple switched to 64-bit operating systems about five years ago. In fact, most people do. Microsoft, so on and Dell. And uh, Epson still hasn't produced a 64-bit software for Apple computers to control their, um, their projectors. Okay, now back to differential equations. And um, so let's see, what do I need to do to tell this thing to use the, um, oh yes, I need to go to here. Let's now, since I've run out of blackboard space, let's um, use the computer now. First order differential equation. So these are, of course, the easiest kind. Uh, you have dy dx um, is equal to some function, and you can write it in general as minus p over q. So one can write it as p dx plus q dy equals zero. Now, if it's separable, a separable differential equation is even easier than a first order ordinary differential equation in general. Uh, what you can, uh, if, if you can separate x from y in this equation, for example, you can write it as f of x dx plus g y dy, then we say that this equation is separable and this is the separated form. And what you can do then is you just integrate uh, this equation and you get zero is the integral of f of x prime plus g of y prime integrated dy. And you then have a function y of x. And that's the solution. An example that's kind of amusing and which I learned from Murray Gelman, who used to give a short course here um, on uh, complexity theory and um, it was um, amazing to listen to him especially uh, I would ask him questions that weren't really about complexity theory because I wasn't interested in complexity theory and I would ask him Jason questions and then he'd go off on tangents and his tangents were the most amazing, the interesting um, short talks um, it was just uh, because the man had, was so intelligent and had such wide experience that um, it was just amazing listening to him. Anyway, one of the things he talked about was um, that Auerbach in 1913 noticed that many quantities are distributed in this way dn is minus a dx over x to the k plus 1. Now, what is that, of course, is an OD, an ordinary differential equation that is separable and separated. If k is not 0, we can integrate it uh, to 
n plus c is a over k x to the k, and so in other words, we well, you just integrate both sides, obviously, and um, you then solve for x. x is 1 over k, the kth root of this ratio, which c is a constant. Now, it turns out that the simplest case is k equal to 1, and this occurs frequently as, uh, of course, the equation then is x is just a over n plus c, and it's called Zipf's law. I can't quite pronounce the zip, but anyway, the zip wall. With c equal to zero, it applies to a large number of, of lists of things, in particular lists of populations of cities. If the largest city, city of rank one, has population x, then the city cities of rank two, three, and four typically will have a population like x over 2, x over 3, x over 4. Um, again, with c equal to 0, Zipf's law applies to the occurrence of numbers in a table, arbitrary table, phone book, um, whatever, because we don't have phone books anymore. When I was a kid, I lived in New York City, and the phone book from Manhattan was that thick. Anyway, the occurrence of numbers x in a table. So um, now x is a over n because c is 0 and k is 1. The rank n of number x is approximately a over x. So the number of numbers that occur with first digit d and say four trailing digits will be d000 zero, 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 minus d. 9999, and this, in other words, number, rank, D, all right. So anyway, the rank, the difference of the ranks, in other words. So that's A, 1 over D, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1 over D, 9999. And if you multiply that out, what you get is A, 10 to the minus 4 over D, D plus 1. So, the first digit is D, it occurs less frequently than 1, in fact, by a factor of 45. And um, I was sitting in class listening to Gelman, and one of the students said, who was from Germany, said that the German government used this fact to catch people who were cheating on taxes. So if you cheat on your taxes, and you want to claim a deduction that is illegitimate, make the first digit a one. So don't deduct $95 or $950. Deduct $150 or $1,009, but not, don't start with nine. All right, well, we'll pick up the logistic equation, um, which is an interesting and amusing equation. Tuesday in the new building, and um, by the way, this logistic equation, um, when we get to this particular version that follows directly from this, it took me 10 or 15 minutes to re-derive it this afternoon, so it's not trivial. It takes you a few minutes. Don't be stupid. All right, we can, I guess, stop now and can turn off the, um, unless somebody has a question.